Okay, so um, I'm just going to get started with my talk. Again, I'm Dr. Kitri, Monica Kitri, um, from the UCLA Doheny Eye Institute, and I also uh, run the uh, pediatric service and the ROP service at Harbor UCLA. So I'm going to be talking today about anti-VEGF um, agents and ROP management. Um, no disclosures to state, except I will be discussing the off-label use of Bevacizumab, which is Avastin, and Aranimizumab, which is Lucentis um, in ROP. So just as a brief, brief overview for the non-ophthalmologists in the room, um, ROP, retinopathy of prematurity, is a potentially blinding disease that affects premature infants that's caused by abnormal retinal vascular development. It affects about 14,000 infants every year in the United States, and of those, 400 to 600 of them become legally blind. So how does it happen? Well, normally in utero, the blood vessels grow outward. They grow outward from the optic nerve to the periphery of the retina. Now, in ROP, what happens is initially when the babies are just born, um, they're born prematurely and the vessels stop growing. And then that's followed by a second stage where all those areas of avascular retina are sending out supernormal levels of growth factors that stimulate vessels to grow, but in an abnormal fashion. So one of those growth factors is VEGF, or vascular endothelial growth factor. And again, this is a hypoxia-induced vasoproliferative factor. So it is necessary for normal vascular development in the retina. The problem in ROP is that those levels in the vitreous and in, you know, within the eye become supernormal, and it's those high levels that cause the problem um, that we see. So just as a little bit of a brief overview, how we talk about ROP, we talk about it in terms of zones and stages. And so the zones basically refer to the location of the disease. So zone one disease is the most posterior. That's going to be where you have the most aggressive disease and where those babies are at the highest risk of um, suffering vision loss from it. And then briefly, we talk about the stages. It talks about the severity of the disease at that particular zone. So stage zero is going to be where it's just immature. Stage one is where you actually see a demarcation line um, separating the uh, vascular and the avascular retina. Stage two is where you see a ridge. And stage three is where you start to see new aberrant blood vessels formation, which you can see close to that ridge right there. And then stage four and five are where you start to get into the retinal detachments. So complications that we can see from ROP to affect vision, obviously a retinal detachment just from the traction and pulling on the retina from the vessels. You can also get macular drag where, again, the traction pulls the uh, macula temporally and can cause distortions therein. And then these patients are also at higher risk of developing other eye problems such as myopia, amblyopia, strabismus, cataract, and so on. So the current gold standard for ROP treatment is really laser. Um, laser, you know, what we, what we do there is we use photoablation to essentially, you know, kill off, you know, all the retinal cells in the avascular retina. And you can see these laser burns right there on the left side of that picture. What that does is it decreases the growth factor burden within the eye so that those aberrant blood vessels can then regress. And this remains a very effective treatment for ROP. It, it allows an 85% reduction in unfavorable structural outcomes um, for patients. One of the other good benefits of this treatment is it can be very targeted. You can place the laser spots just where you need to, um, and you're not really affecting just by the treatment per se um, of, of the central macula or, or the central retina. Another good benefit of it is it's a tried and true treatment. We have years and years of experience and data, and we know its safety and efficacy. But laser does not come without side effects. It's not a perfect treatment modality for ROP. And one of the main um, problems that we have with laser, it's an inherently destructive procedure. Essentially what we're doing is we're sacrificing the peripheral retina and the peripheral visual field so that way we can salvage the central retina and the patient's central visual acuity. There's a lot of logistical and technical difficulties with laser. It's a time-consuming procedure. It can take a few hours. Babies need to be under systemic anesthesia to get it done. Um, and it can be difficult, particularly in areas, you know, the remote areas of the United States as well as internationally, to actually find um, a, an ophthalmologist that is able to do the laser. We also know that these babies are at higher risk of having high myopia, and not just, you know, minus one or minus two. You know, some of these kids go on to have minus 15, minus 20 diopters of myopia, which really puts them at very high risk of amblyopia. Um, and then despite laser, you know, like as I mentioned, it's, it's not 100% effective. There are still a portion of patients that will go on to have poor structural and visual outcomes. So that brings us really to the crux of this talk, which are the anti-VEGF agents. 
So anti-VEGF agents, um, they're essentially intravitreal injections of, uh, of these drugs that will go within the eye to basically bind to the circulating VEGF. And it's been used extensively, you know, um, in, in recent years in adult vasoproliferative disorders, such as macular degeneration, retinal vein occlusions, diabetic retinopathy, with very good success. And so it was just a matter of time before it was introduced for ROP as well. So initially when um, anti-VEGF agents were introduced for ROP, they were used mainly for compassionate use. They were used for babies where um, they couldn't, you know, there, there was no view, either from a vitreous hemorrhage or for corneal opacity. There was no view to complete the laser treatment. Or the disease was refractory to laser. Or, you know, in some instances where there was no access to a laser or to an ophthalmologist who could perform the laser. But the landscape for ROP treatment really changed with the publication of this study in 2011, which is the BROP study. So this was a randomized control trial that looked at babies who had very posterior ROP, so zone one or posterior zone two disease, and randomized them to either getting intravitreal um, bevacizumab or Avastin versus laser. And they found really good results. They found that those babies who received anti-VEGF injections had recurrence rates of about 6% versus 26% recurrence rate in the laser group. So you know, this was terrific. This offered an alternative to laser here. But one of the most exciting things about this was that not only did this treatment work, but it also allowed, you know, this was a non-destructive treatment. The, if you look on the right side, um, those are fluorescein andrograms that are taken several months after um, uh, the treatment was done. And on the top right, you know, that's a fluorescein androgram after laser therapy. And you can see that, you know, all that big expanse, I don't know if this laser works, Nope. Okay. Um, you can see the big expanse of um, just atrophy. That's essentially non-functional retina from the laser. But the, you know, the macula looks relatively intact. The vessels look great otherwise. But you know, we've lost that temporal, you know, that retinal function. Now, if you look at the bottom right um, photo, that's after the intravitreal bevacizumab, and you can see you know, how much more those vessels have been allowed to grow. And theoretically, that retinal should hopefully function better and provide this eye with a wider visual field. One of the other, you know, nice things about anti-VEGF therapy is that, you know, you don't really need systemic anesthesia. It's a quick procedure, um, several minutes versus a couple hours. Um, and as we know from Dr. Giancone's talk, you know, the systemic anesthesia is not a trivial concern. One of the other happy side effects of using anti-VEGF is that these patients tend to have um, lower degrees of myopia. So in that same study with the BROP, they followed those patients, and then at two and a half years, they looked at their cycloplegic refractions. And if we look specifically at the patients who had zone one disease initially, the babies who had received bevacizumab had a mean spherical equivalent about minus one and a half. And then when you look at the babies who received laser, at age two and a half, they were already over minus eight of myopia. And you could just imagine that as they get older, that discrepancy is gonna become even larger. Now, so there's a, there's a lot of reasons to get excited about anti-VEGF agents, but there are several concerns that still linger um, with this. And one probably, one of the most you know, pressing concerns is, is this treatment gonna affect babies' systemic development? We know that the drugs do get absorbed into the blood. Um, we can detect them up to 60 days, particularly with the bevacizumab, um, after they're injected. And VEGF is a needed growth factor, not just for the retina, but for lung development, kidney development, lung, um, uh, brain development. Every, you know, it affects a lot of different organ um, uh, development processes. And this is a very sensitive population. This is their premature infants in the throes of their organ development. So how does that affect this? If you look at the serum VEGF levels, um, you can see the, the bottom two lines, those are um, varying degrees of, um, varying uh, doses of bevacizumab. And you can see that serum VEGF levels drop quite substantially after um, the treatment. And that drop can persist for up to 60 days after the treatment. So how does this you know, affect real world? We don't really know yet. Um, there are some animal studies that have shown some increased rates of pulmonary hypertension and bronchopulmonary dysplasia when they're exposed to the anti-VEGF agents. In human case reports, there seem to be some indication of perhaps higher rates of pulmonary maturation problems, respiratory failure, hepatic dysfunction. But this is a very difficult population to study because you know, these are already a very high-risk cohort 
of patients that are receiving these injections because they're, they're not usually the ones that have just any ROP. They're the ones that have the most aggressive form of ROP and having the posterior zones. And so those babies inherently are at higher risk for having many of these other comorbidities. They usually are the ones that are getting a lot of um, surgeries, are having more platelet transfusions, or have necrotizing enterocolitis. So they're already an inherently high-risk group. I just wanted to briefly touch on this study um, because this came out a couple years ago and really rang a lot of alarm bells um, for pediatricians and neonatologists in the community. This was a study that came out of Canada um, two years ago, and they retrospectively looked at their babies who had received bevacizumab versus those who had received laser. And they found that the ones who had received the anti-VEGF therapy had a three times higher odds of developing severe neurodeve neurodevelopmental disability. Now, the big problem with this study, though, was that it was retrospective, and those two groups that they had were inherently different. You had, you know, the babies who had received laser had by, nef by definition, they had less severe disease than the ones that had received the, the bevacizumab for the more posterior aggressive disease. And as we just talked about, you know, having those two different groups is very difficult to compare whether or not that difference that they saw was because of the drug or was it just because inherently the other group, um, you know, as, was at higher risk of having uh, morbidity. <laughs> um, just in the interest of time, I'm going to skip um, these slides here. But I did want to talk about the recurrence rate of um, after anti-VEGF um, versus laser. Depending on the studies, the recurrence rates can be a little bit variable, but they seem to be in the same rate when we compare anti-VEGF and laser. But the timing um, that that recurrence occurs is very different. Within, with laser, if you're going to get a recurrence, it usually happens within the first several weeks. In the BeatRob study, the mean time to recurrence was around six and a half weeks. Whereas with anti-VEGF, that recurrence can come much later. In the BeatRob study, that time to recurrence was 19 weeks after the treatment. And there have been reports where they see recurrences up to 89 weeks postmenstrual age. So that brings up a lot of issues because these babies then need to be followed every one to two weeks, possibly up to a year of age. And so it's difficult to bring those families in, you know, to get those follow-up exams done. Plus, it becomes harder to examine these babies the older and bigger they are. You can't swaddle them and just, and, and just get a thorough dilated retinal exam. So many of these babies require serial exams under anesthesia. So where do we go from here? Well, you know, some, um, you know, there have been some efforts to try to see, can we just reduce the uh, dosing that we're giving of the bevacizumab? Because by, by her, by doing that, perhaps we can reduce the systemic toxicity. And that's very possible. In the BeatRob study, um, they arbitrarily chose the dose as half the adult dose that we, that we normally give. There was a recent study that came out of the PEDEG group um, that looked at doses that were as low as 20 times less that, that dose that was used at the BeatRob study and still found some effective regression. What if we use a different drug? So ranimizumab, or Lucentis, um, is a smaller molecule, and it, is, um, uh, it has a shorter systemic half-life, so this may make it a safer alternative um, than bevacizumab for ROP. And you can see on that graph here in the black, um, that's the drop in serum VEGF levels that you get with bevacizumab, whereas in the white, you can see the drop that you get with ranimizumab. So it affects the serum VEGF levels much less. So this could be a good alternative to bevacizumab. And I know that Dr. Um, Irina Sway at, um, at Ronald Reagan will use the ranimizumab. The one obstacle that we really have for implementing this more on a um, worldwide or na nationwide even is the cost, though because this can be over a couple thousand dollars versus the bevacizumab is, can be under a couple hundred. And then finally, um, you know, efforts are being made to combine the best of both worlds. You know, what if we use the anti-VEGF agents in kind of the very active, you know, parts of the posterior ROP, and then after that we can use delayed laser. This is a protocol that's used by Dr. Sway you know, where they inject anti-VEGF during the acute phase of ROP, allow the vessels to grow outward, you know, away from zone one, away from posterior zone two, and then um, check for signs of recurrences. And if at 52 weeks there's still no recurrence, just um, uh, use laser to ablate all the areas of remaining avascular retina. So the advantages of this is that you still get the benefit of having the retina and having the retinal vessels kind of grow outward, you know, farther away from the macula, but you're reducing the risk of having a delayed recurrence, and you're also delaying the anesthesia so when, to when the babies are a bit older. 
So in conclusion, anti-VEGF agents hold a lot of promise in offering a safe, effective alternative to laser for ROP. But I think one of the most important things to take home from this is it's really important to have a good discussion with the parents and with the neonatology team regarding the risks and benefits of both treatments. And, you know, for example, if I, if I have a family that I know is not going to be good at follow-up, I perhaps would stay away from the anti-VEGF agents because that can be such an issue. And hopefully as time goes on and we have more data, um, getting the optimal dose, optimal medication, and how to follow up these patients appropriately um, will be better delineated. Okay? Thank you. I can take maybe a couple questions, if there's any. There we go. Is so, based on the, the zone, or is actually kind of a time moment where you're going to do the laser? So I know at, at, at Ronald Reagan at UCLA, they have a, like a very specific protocol. Well, they'll, I think they'll do it at 52 weeks, if I'm not mistaken. At Harbor, when we have done it, um, we typically will do it before discharge. Because, you know, if... Um, if there still remains a large area you know, of avascularity and the babies are about to be sent home, we have, we, unfortunately with our population, we have a very high rate of noncompliance with coming back in for follow-up, and so we'll laser whatever avascular retina is left before they go home. Yes, of course. risk of anesthesia is less. How, how often do you see these patients? Every week? Every other week? After the injection? That's mm, a good point. Maybe, yeah, every week until then. Yeah, we do every week. Too. Yes? Uh, I inject at 0.75 mil millimeters. It's like an eyeball thing. <laughs> you know, not, not, no, yeah. no pun intended, but you can't exactly measure. So about one millimeter. But it's, it should be 0.75 millimeters. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Kushri.